I can't tell you how exciting it is to be an evolutionary biologist um, over the last five years or so. I mean, to give you an example, uh, when I came to U of T many years ago, uh, I worked intensively for about 10 or 15 years on, on trying to understand a couple of genes in the organisms that I was studying at the time. And then by the 80s and 90s, we'd expanded our repertoire a little bit and we got up to looking at sort of 20 or 30 genes. Um, and within the last few years, because of high throughput DNA sequencing, we've been able to look at whole genomes. And so now we have to deal with thousands of genes. In fact, um, you know, the organism that we're studying right now, we've just been looking at a data set involving 27,000 genes. Often it's assumed that evolutionary biologists, because evolutionary biology is known as a historical science, it's all about looking back into the dim distant past. I often get asked, do I study dinosaurs? I'm an evolutionary biologist, do I study dinosaurs? And I say, no, actually, I don't study dinosaurs. They're very interesting, but um, what I study is contemporary evolution, evolution that's happening now. Some of the best places to study evolution are in hospitals. There are plenty of wonderful examples of uh, things like antibiotic resistance, and there's lots of contemporary evolution going on in agriculture the evolution of herbicide resistance in weeds or insecticide resistance. These are all uh, cases where we can actually see organisms evolving as we speak. I'm particularly interested in studying invasive species, not only because they're very interesting from an evolutionary viewpoint, but of course um, they're also, they have amazingly important impact on society. Um, Invasive species cost uh, North American taxpayers over $120 billion last year, indirectly, of course, and um, they're also responsible for the loss of biodiversity. I've been close to a half of all threatened and rare species in North America are so uh, because their habitats are being dramatically affected by uh, invasive species. Of course, invasive species are very serious agricultural weeds and pests, and uh, because of that, um, we're dumping tons and tons of pesticides into the environment to get rid of them. Now, I've chosen to study two particular groups of plant invaders because I'm very interested in biological invasions. And the two groups that I work on are both very serious problems in which literally millions of dollars are spent annually to try and control these plants. The first group of plants uh, I work on uh, is purple loosestrife. During the time I've been at the University of Toronto, I've literally watched this plant march northward. Um, it used to be relatively uncommon um, in southern Ontario. Now it's everywhere. It's now moving north, and I've seen it move up through the Muskokas, Algonquin, uh, Barry's Bay, and now right up to Moosonee. I mean, it's gone as far as uh, up into northern Ontario. And so what we were very interested in was how is this plant coping with a changing in the changing environment that it is experiencing as it's marching northward? Is it evolving and adapting to a shorter growing season? And what we've been able to show is that indeed it has, in a relatively short period of time, purple roosterife has evolved locally adapted populations which can deal with a very short growing season and it's done this by flowering faster. There is sufficient genetic variation in the populations that have been introduced for the plant to have evolved shorter and shorter uh, time to flowering, so um, the time it takes for a plant to go from seedling to flowering is much faster in the north than it is in the south. And this has all occurred in the last 30 to 50 years. Now, the other, the other interesting problem I'm studying is in water hyacinth. And there we're using a somewhat different approach. And that relates to a long-standing interest of mine, and that is to stu in studying the mating biology of plants. As you probably are aware, plants are largely hermaphroditic. They're bisexual. They can reproduce both as a maternal and a paternal parent. And therefore, they have the option uh, of not only cross-pollinating, which produces lots of genetic variability, but if there aren't mates around, unlike us, um, they can mate with themselves. 
Uh, but that requires certain genetic changes to allow them to self-fertilize. And this is quite an important transition for uh, enhancing the ability of these populations to colonize areas. One can easily imagine that if during invasion a single individual is dispersed and then germinates and the plant now is growing in an area by itself, um, if it requires a mate in order to start a population off, then it's doomed if it's on its own. But on the other hand, if it can self-fertilize, then it can start a colony, and then now we have the population that's spreading. Um, so I'm very interested in this idea that the evolution of self-fertilization enhances colonization ability and invasion success. And what we've discovered is that in water hyacinth, this plant in Brazil is largely outcrossing because it's pollinated there by rather specialized long-tongue bees. But it's got dispersed to the Caribbean where it's now a prolific weed of rice. There are rice fields particularly in Cuba but also in Jamaica. And this plant now is a very serious um, weed of rice. And those populations have the ability to self-fertilize. It was those individuals that could colonize the Caribbean where the pollinators are absent. So we've got the evolution of self-fertilization which has given this ability of the plant to colonize in the absence of its specialized pollinators. And what we're trying to do now using genomics is to fish out the genes that are actually responsible for this evolutionary change.